The book that I've chosen to talk about is The Absolute True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexie. And the book is a story of Junior, a very bright kid, a budding cartoonist who's growing up on the Spokane Indian Reservation. He's had medical, multiple medical problems is, and is picked on by everyone except his one and only friend. So Junior begins the school year, and he is stopped short when I saw this written on the inside front cover. This book belongs to Agnes Adams. Okay, now you're probably asking yourself, who is Agnes Adams? Well, let me tell you, Agnes Adams is my mother, my mother, and Agnes is her maiden name. So that means my mother was born on Adam and Adams, and she was still an Adams when she wrote her name in the book. And she was 30 when she gave birth to me. So yeah, so that means I was staring at a geometry book that was at least 30 years old than I was. I couldn't believe it. How horrible is that? My school and my tribe are so poor and so sad that we have to study from the same dang books our parents studied from. That is absolutely the saddest thing in the world. And let me tell you, that old, 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 decrepit geometry book hit my heart with the force of a nuclear bomb. My hopes and dreams floated up into a mushroom cloud. So what do you do when the world has declared nuclear war on you? Well, he threw the book, and he hit his teacher, and he was promptly suspended. And it was then that Junior makes the decision that he will survive. He will leave the reservation to attend an all-white school in the neighboring farm town some 22 miles away, where the only other Indian is the mascot. Parents have taken issue with this book, especially with the swearing and the mentions of racism and sex in the book. Yes, he does use the word boner, and yes, he does talk about erections and masturbating. And he also talks about poverty, such bone-crushing poverty where his family can't afford to take his cat to the veterinarian so it dies, how his parents work very hard to scrape together enough money to pay for him for gas to get to school, for lunch money, a new pair of jeans, a new shirt, and he lied about how poor he was. He also writes about the assumptions that white people have about Indians. The assumption that government just gives money to Indians, that's wrong, that's false. <clears throat> the assumption that Spokanes have lots of money because they have a casino, again, wrong. The only reason they have money is because they work at the casino. He pretended that he was not poor. And to do that, he develops this wonderful list of excuses. He pretended that he wasn't hungry. He pretended he was sick when he didn't have money for a field trip or a school dance. He pretended that natives were allergic or diabetes prone, so he could make purchases at bake sales to support a school effort. He pretended to be old school and listen to records because his family couldn't afford the, an iPod or the latest electronic gadget. And then the fallback was that he had to attend a cultural event. Finally, when his new basketball team beats the reservation school team that he was once a member of, he realizes, I mean, geez, all of the seniors on our team were going to college. All of the guys on our team had their own cars. All of the guys on our team had iPods and cell phones and PSPs and three pairs of blue jeans and ten shirts and mothers and fathers who went to church and had good jobs. Okay, so maybe my white teammates had problems, serious problems, but none of those problems were life-threatening. And as he looked over at the Welpin at Redskins at Rowdy, I knew that two 
or three of those Indians might not have eaten breakfast that morning. There was no food in the house. I knew that seven or eight of those Indians lived with drunken mothers and fathers. I knew that one of those Indians had a father who dealt crack and meth. And I knew two of those Indians had fathers in prison. And I knew that none of them were going to college, not one of them. Alexei himself has pushed back against critics who call the content of his book inappropriate for young people. And he has argued <clears throat> that when cultural critics fret about the ever more appalling young adult books, they aren't trying to protect African American teens forced to walk through metal detectors on their way to school or Mexican American teens enduring the culturally schizophrenic life of being American citizens and the children of illegal immigrants, Native American teens growing up on third world reservations, or poor white kids trying to survive the meth haze trailer parks. They aren't trying to protect the poor from poverty. They're simply trying to protect their privileged notions of what literature is and what it should be. But more importantly, he also talks about hope and love and tolerance. And because of that, I hope you read the book, because it's absolutely true. I'm Gita Sweeney, and I'm a citizen of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. I'm an associate professor here in the Department of Psychology at the University of Montana, and I teach at the Multicultural Psychology course at the graduate and undergraduate level. I also direct the Indians into Psychology program that trains natives into the clinical psychology field, and I read Ben books. Mm -hmm.